right to be asked by Penn uh, to do things, as they do do, and I'm very grateful for them for being in touch. Um, so we'll start off with... Uh, to start with, I always like how vague it is how many albums I've made under the name John Wesley Harding. I personally don't know. And every time people say, I say somewhere between 15 and 20, I just pick a number. So, so um, this is How to Lead a Double Life. Sadly, it's not going to be referring to my second family <laughs> in London that nobody knows about, or my spying that I do on the side like a TV show. It's disappointingly just about novels and songs. And how you do it is very simple, and we'll start with step one. And it is to write a song. Um, and what happens is I was um, at Cambridge University, and there was a fantastic university art cinema called the Cambridge Art Cinema, and there I saw Paul Morrissey, for example, a screen, you know, his uh, vampire movies, and say, somebody said, what would you like to tell us about Bob Dylan? And he said, speaking of Jewish lesbians, <laughs> and I saw um, John Waters introduce his movie. That was a very great place to go. And in fact, I ended up ushering there, which is described in my new novel, Wonder Kid, which basically revolved around, you know, popping out for a cigarette in the middle of Dr. Caligari down to the, down to the bathrooms. But I remember I saw a movie there, my guess, French, century set in the 19th, made in the 20th a horrific abortion scene. <clears throat> Real backstreet, nasty stuff. And I remember walking away from that movie and thinking, and this, so this is about the mid 80s, probably 85 or 86. My guess is that Gerard Depardieu was in that movie. I don't know that, but there was probably, he was probably in it. Um, and uh, I remember walking away from that movie and I was, I just left the person that I'd seen and I was walking back to my college and I came up with the line, <clears throat> I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth. And I remember thinking that is as disgusting and, and, and compelling to me a line as that scene I've just seen because I was trying to make that horrific backstreet abortion <clears throat> into something that felt really visceral to me. And I was already writing songs by that time. And uh, so I came up with this line, I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth and I was dumped down south. And I fiddled around with that line for years and years and years. And what happened at the end of university was I, like everybody else, uh, left university not having any idea what I would do, why I'd been, um, except that I liked being in plays and I liked playing the guitar. And somebody said to me, oh, you really like music and you got a first and you're good at English, because I did actually enjoy the academic bit very much. They said, what you should do is you should do a PhD. That's a great idea for you, but don't do it in English, don't do it in music, do it in social and political science because they'll let you in. And so I decided to do this PhD in social and political science where I was writing about, kind of trying to write about, you know, those kind of Benjamin and Adorno and those kind of people and trying to point out that the music they'd listened to at the time was incredibly bad music. And if they'd only been able to hear the Beastie Boys, you know, they'd have enjoyed the age of art in mechanical time, mechanical, mechanical reproduction. So, uh, but they, so I did this for a couple of years and I went out on the road and I started playing my songs and I kept fiddling with this song and a whole 10 years later, 10 years later, I wrote the first verse of that song having written the first two lines. And the first two lines were, I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth, I was dumped down south. Very depressing. Now I know the way that my mind works when it comes time to write a song. I will very much trust in the little rhymes and the things that words do. I'll let words do a lot of the work for me when I'm beginning a song. I will just write blab, and provided it rhymes and provided it scans, I'm happy to sing it that way for a little while. I'm happy to let that be the song until I decide later. But the funny thing is that sometimes you never change the thing that you <clears throat> came up with that you were just you know, playing around with. And so it ended up as, I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth, 
I was dumped down south. And I remember thinking at one point, that is so depressing. It's the most horrible beginning to a song you could possibly imagine. And so the next line was, I was found by the richest man in the world because it perked me right up writing that song. I'm completely serious. I was like, you've given this small, possibly not even living fetus, this horrible beginning to a possible life, a probable death, and but he's found by the rich man in the world. And then I would have been like, okay, world. Mouth, south, world. And world is a tricky, it's a tricky word to rhyme, but I've committed myself. I mean, you can't have the richest man in the land. Or it's got to be the richest man in the world. And so I was thinking, well, you know, what, what rhymes with world? I and mean, this is totally true, because I remember thinking it. And, and, the, and the thing that came up was girl. And th because you've got burl or curl or, you know, uh, nothing was happening. So I was found by the rich man in the world who brought me up as a girl. And that was only written for sure because I was trying to write something into the scansion of the tune that I'd written. And that was also only written because I just decided that the rhyming of those words, uh, you know, w w was necessary in an AABB scheme. And so that's why the song happened. The song only happened really because I let two words rhyme that just came out together. So I already had, I, I had a nice, little tune for this one from the beginning. I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth Oh yeah, and I was dumped down south I was found by the richest man in the world Oh yeah, he brought me up as a girl My sheets are satin but my mind's a mess But there are worse things I confess Than drinking tea in a pretty dress And I'm here to tell you that's not all bad Count your blessings, maybe you'll be glad. So that was the first verse, written very quickly, uh, and then going into the chorus, which I like the idea of the chorus was, um, you know, uh, it's not all bad, you know, count your blessings. And in fact, when we were, when, I, when Misfortune was finally published, the novel that, I'll be talking about a little because of the song. Uh, my mother always said to me, she's very like you, the main character. And I was like, it's about a boy dressed up in girls' clothes, mum. Uh, and she said, but you know, she, he just, uh, the, the, the character just takes everything that's thrown at him and kind of has a good time with it. And I was like, thank you very much. So, because that first movie that I'd seen was essentially set in the 19th century, the Gerard Depardieu movie that I don't know what it was called. So the song is kind of set then too, which you can kind of tell with the satin sheets a bit. And the second verse makes that a little bit clearer because it becomes a kind of, by the way I'm free associating writing the song, it becomes a kind of, um, kind of an inheritance thing, a Dickensian kind of thing. So it becomes, when he died, I inherited his wealth Oh yeah, and I revealed myself I was snubbed by the friends that he'd never had Oh yeah, they sided with my dad All my riches are beyond control but it's the same old rigmarole They say I've lost my very soul Maybe I have But I'm here to tell you that's not all bad Count your blessings and maybe you'll be glad
And then there's a little bridge, which is. And as I grew, so did my fame. So I gave it up and changed my name. It's catch as catch can, and you'll never know who I am, who I am. And then there's a little solo, which became a very important part of the song to me because a few years later, as I was playing it live, which I often did with my friend Robert Lloyd, who's now the TV critic for the LA Times, and he would play a mandolin solo, a very discursive one, and a surprisingly lengthy one, getting ever longer at that moment in the song. And what I thought every night when I was singing that song was, the story isn't finished. Because there's another verse after that bridge. The bridge has set up a running away, and it's set up a, an adventure, and it's set up, a, in Hollywood terms, a final act where everything's going to come together. But here's what happens in the final verse of the song, which, as I sang it, I've never changed it, except in the novel, but as, as I sang it after, I would think about it when, when Robert was playing his solo. And it just skips to the cosmic final deathbed scene. It's like the whole life has happened in the solo. <clears throat> so the last verse is... <clears throat> when I died, I hoped to hear the angel's song. Oh, yeah, but was I wrong? They threw me right back there in that lane. Oh, yeah, they said, boys, start again. When you're turning off your bedside light Consider me and my wretched plight Looks like I'm gonna have to get it right this time But I'm here to tell you that it's not all bad Count your blessings and you'll be glad, you'll be glad Count your blessings, maybe you'll be glad. And then there's another little solo at the end. So that, excuse me while I put that aside, that is how the song goes. And you can tell that what happened is, for some reason, I thought it was beautiful to just skip to the end of the life. So what I next did was write a novel about the song. Now, I don't know if anybody else ever in history has written a song. I mean, I'm not proud of it, but written a song and then gone, that song's not finished. I shall write a 700-page novel about it in the Dickensian language it demands. Well, I mean, aside from the various battles that in my head, about whether this was worth doing, worth starting, able to be gone on with, um, you know, worth ever not doing a gig for, which was bringing in ready money, uh, uh, when this was bringing in nothing at no speed and taking seven years. But what I did was <clears throat> I mapped the chapters onto the lines of the book. I just said, oh, okay, well, we'll have a chapter with, I was born with a coat hanger in my mouth, so that's the abortion scene. I was dumped down south. That'd be the first chapter. And then, but then what you have to do is in a, in a novel, and sure, I'm not telling you anything because you've been to pen events before, but in a novel, things kind of, in the kind of novel I was interested in writing, things kind of have to make sense. And in a song, it's perfectly fine to go, <clears throat> I was find, found by the richest man in the world who brought me up as a girl. That's totally what Towns Van Zandt would have said in a song. He would have kept it very pithy and just given you the details, and the rest is for the listener to work out. Well, that's not good enough in a novel, uh, particularly in, in the kind of... They called it an adventure novel, which I didn't, wasn't even sure what an adventure novel was, really. But to me, it was, you know, it was a Dickensian novel, and giving particularly back to three writers that I really love, Dickens, Thackeray, and Trollope, and giving 
back, and Jane Austen a little bit as well, and giving, back, giving something back to them <clears throat> through my enjoyment of them, uh, which was sex, basically, and gender. Because they didn't touch gender and sex. They touched sex, but they didn't touch gender with a barge pole because they couldn't... It wasn't, you know, it wasn't on the, on the menu. It wasn't something. So I thought, well, at least if I write a faux Dickensian pastiche novel, if I make it about gender, that'll be interesting. Well, it turned out that other people were kind of having the same... I mean, maybe people had done it before, but I wasn't aware of it. But it turned out that quite soon the novel was taught in university courses along with a fingersmith by Sarah Waters and Crimson Petal and the White, which I've never read and don't quite know what it's about, but apparently it's kind of in the same bag. So, you know, I wasn't the only person thinking this. Um, but so the novel took a, a very long time, and what I did was, you know, you're like in a situation with, okay, so he's brought the child up as a girl. Why? Because he's obsessed with the sanctity of femininity. Why? Uh, because he had a little sister he was in love with. Why? Why is he so obsessed with her? Because he was falling in a... He was sitting in a tree... This, this, this next leap was totally because of Michael Peach, by the way. Because he was uh, sitting in a... My, who, who helped me edit this bit of the book. Because he was sitting in a tree when they were very young, and she fell, and he wasn't able to get down with the tree, and he just looked at her sprawled, dead body, and he goes up to the top of the house where they have a doll's house, which is the size of a... Because I'd just been to the Rijksmuseum and I'd seen all the poppin' houses there. And, and he has this doll's house and he opens the top of the doll's house and she's in there. And she talks, he talks to her in there. So it's all totally like back, taking the lyrics of this song, backpedaling towards a kind of rational reality. For example, working out why the father brought the child up as a girl, or in other words, it's a boy, sorry, maybe I didn't make this clear. It's a boy child, and he decides to bring it up in girls' clothes without the child's knowledge. And he's so rich that he is able to insulate this house, because he's the richest man in the world, as I've made so patently clear early on in the song. And he's, he's able to insulate the house and take all the art off the walls and... The child just grows up in a what you would now call a hothouse atmosphere where, you know, the child is cultivated as this weird... So it's okay to imagine why the father did this. I think that's, you know, I was able to get that. But why did the mother do it? I mean, what kind of mother could there be? They were, well, what, what it turned out was there's a mother who's into Swedenborg and various religious craziness that believes that Jesus is you know, um, dual sexuality and uh, du uh, dual gender. And one of the major Swedenborgian poets I posited was called Mary Day, and all her poetry is in the house. And so she has to get into the house to order the library of Mary Day. And she's given this opportunity to bring up... So the whole thing was just this backpedaling away from this crazy nonsense that I made up in the song, so it made sense, a, a kind of psychological sense in the book. And, you know, and that was, the, that was the novel. So, right. So what happened was I'd written this novel, and without going into the long and the short of it, I met a friend of mine at a party who I didn't really know was a book publisher. And I said, I've written this book. He said, how long did that take? Three weeks? And I said, no. Uh, and I said, no, it took seven years. And he said, what's it about? I said, you, what, you don't even want to hear about it. He said, oh, well, I'd like to get it from an agent. So I, I got an agent. The first thing I said to her at the meeting was, um, I, it's got to come out under my own name. This cannot come out under the name John Wesley Harding. John Wesley Harding is the name of a Bob Dylan record from 1967. I only took it when I started making music because I was just about to start teaching at Cambridge University. And the last thing that I wanted uh, was for anybody to know what I was doing and how quickly my career would crash and burn. But it's been going on and apparently it's going to continue and I'm completely stuck with the name John Wesley Harding. Whether I like it or not, which I do, but... The one thing it will not appear on is the spine of this book. And in fact, my father had put me slightly in mind of this when, when he heard, when he got wind of the fact I'd written a novel, he said, well, I hope, that, I hope the author's going to fly under his true colors on this book. That's exactly what he said. And I was like, yes, yes, the author shall do that, father. 
Peter, as I call him, and uh, Sir, often. And, um, and so I decided that would be the thing. Now, the other thing that was, and this is what I didn't say at the time, I also did have the slight idea that when musicians bring out novels or other artistic products under their musicianly name, those are given very bad reviews in newspapers, for they are taken to be hobbyish and, and uh, beside the point, and only to have been published because that musician had a career elsewhere and possibly of no literary merit. Honorable exceptions to this include Jimmy Buffett, Kinky Friedman, people who are safely chucked in little genres of literature that are not, in essence, considered literary. You know, they're, they're off in the crime sections and the mystery sections and stuff like that. And this was proved recently because a really good novel a couple of years ago was Josh Ritter's novel that I can't remember the name of, but it was so... Brightness Falls. No, that's a Jane McInerney novel. It had... Thank you, Bright's Passage, thank you. A wonderful novel given a completely appalling review by Stephen King in the New York Times. I mean, the big, a bigger review than I'd ever had in the New York Times. That was an entire page of Stephen King just saying, this novel was only published because Josh Ritter has a recording career and someday he may amount to something. I mean, it was awful. So, I mean, and I read reviews of novels by Steve Earl and, and short stories by Roseanne Cash, and whether they were good reviews or bad reviews, they always seemed to me to be a little patting on the head of that person and an offer to go away for a little longer. Um, I'm sure there have been honourable exceptions to this, and, um, and, and th indeed things may be changing, but I did not want to happen, that to happen to a book I'd worked on very hard for seven years, so I published it under my own name, Wesley Stace. The one nice effect of this was that Although I didn't make a secret of my other musical identity, this, rather than it being force-fed to journalists, it meant that they were actually able to kind of discover that, bizarrely, the writer of this incredibly long, somewhat you know, serious book uh, with complete sentences and adjectives and what have you, um, uh, was, you know, had also done a duet with Bruce Springsteen. So that was a kind of thing that meant that the, the first book got a few lucky breaks because, you know, USA Today, suddenly that made an interview worth doing as opposed to the person who'd written exactly the same book but had just got out of an MFA program. So I uh, published the book under my real name and... Of course, the publisher said, this is suicide. You know, you should publish it under your musical name because then we'll be able to... But I think everybody knows that publishing houses are not, in fact, terribly good at using the promotional opportunities afforded to them and uh, in those kind of ways because it involves a lot of pretty serious thinking and talking to record labels and stuff. And um, so I, in fact, thought rather than oh my goodness, we'll take all the people who buy my folk rock records and they're going to love this 700-page Dick Dickensian novel about gender. Um, those people, they're going to love that. And In fact, in my mind, it was like, well, maybe these people who read this book might actually be drawn towards some of my music and that will actually be where the real stuff happens. So, suddenly, step four... As if behind my back, I've been leading a double life. And this became, this was really nice, actually. Um, you don't want to be the tap-dancing author. You know, when you're asked to do a book festival or the Hay Festival or the whatever, the Dallas Austin Book Festival, you want to go because they think you're you're good and you can read from your book and it will be interesting and they can ask you questions and the fact that you're, you don't really want to be asked, will you play a gig for us for free? You know, because that's annoying because if you just played a gig in Austin, you'd probably get two and a half grand. But if you go to the Austin Book Festival, they just want you to play one for free because it's just going to be so super cool. So it, 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 it gets slightly annoying, but the place it got really annoying eventually was just in the introductions. Just when you're standing by the side of the stage and somebody would go, and Wesley Stace is a novelist, he's published four books, and the first was the name. And under the name John Wesley Harding, he said that this, I mean, this could go on for 
longer than the reading I was just about to do. It could, it could go on any amount of time. So to cut a very long story short, the, the novels were coming out under Wesley Stace and the music was coming out under John Wesley Harding. And it was a, a pretty happy arrangement except for the fact that it was a little bit schizophrenic and I had to have three completely different companies set up for everything. And so it just got a bit tiring. So I just gave it up. And um, in a kind of a, I think I'd been trying, in a sense, to think of ditching the John Wesley Harding name for some time. I had an album in 2000-ish on Hollywood Records called The Confessions of St. Ace, which is Stace. And I was going to actually release it just under the name Stace and call it The Confessions of St. Ace, and they stopped. They didn't want me to do that. And then pretty much anybody you talk to in the professional world of music will be like, you know, way back when it was like, don't do that. They've got a section in Tower Records for John Wesley Harding. Where are they going to put your records? You can't do... You know, and then later on it was like, but The Cabinet of Wonders is on NPR under John Wesley Harding's Cabinet of what are they going to do? Are they just going to change that? And so finally, at some point, I was just like, Wesley Stace has had four novels out or three novels or whatever at this point. He has accrued, I have accrued enough of a name on that level that will ever happen. And if ever I was going to change it, now would be the time to do it. And this just happened, and this is where it all ties quite nicely together. It just happened that at that time, I'd had a rather emotional year and I wrote a series of songs that for I can honestly say this for the first time in my life were all about me they were just songs about me they were about previous people I'd uh, been in love with they were about my family they were about my friend who died on a plane with his wife on their honeymoon after I'd been best man at his wedding um, when I went to his dad's house and the dad asked me to look through his bedroom and find any stuff that I wanted and it was the room we, you know, like hung out in together. It was very strange and I just thought, oh, I'm going to write about these things. And I can't even remember what the exact impetus was for that, but that's what happened. And it was then that I realized, not just for this talk, because it does seem like I'm bringing it all together nicely, but it was then that I realized that in fact the novels were taking care of literature for me. They were taking care of the need to make things up. They were taking care of all those creative impulses to make up worlds and people in them. And I could let music do for me what so many of my friends had been letting it do for them for years and other great songwriters, which was just tell you about their private lives. And I had been, all their feelings about stuff. And of course that was part of my songs. And of course, even a song like Misfortune, of course that's about my private life. But I'd never, and, and it's truly reflective of me, but I had never uh, written, you know, about things that had happened to me recently, uh, really. And so at the end of um, this, I realized that I had this particular mass of songs out there before me, and I suddenly thought, oh, these are the Wesley Stace songs. The, if ever there was gonna be a Wesley Stace album, it's this album, so I called the album self-titled, and everyone was right. It was, it totally didn't, you know, get to the right places because there is, there is still a John Wesley Harding section on all music and people can't access the Wesleys. You know, it, all that stuff was right and I totally don't regret doing it at all. And now my, um, having, having had a bit of schizophrenia for a few years, um, and though all those books and all those songs come from the same place in the end, um, so now they all just come out under Wesley Stace. So that is both how to lead a double life and how to, how to get rid of one too. Here I am. <laughs>